way into the theater conference room. That's right around the park suite. You can go out there, walk over towards the window. There's an alley to the left. You can go down there if you dare. And uh, there's a nice little theater conference type room in there. So Chris Haley will be there. Uh, if you're reading the website, you can have off this. You can yell at me later if there's one or something. Go by what's on the computer program, please, okay? Go by what's in your program. Raffle tickets, if you need to get one, come by the table up front there, we'll give you a raffle ticket. If you got both passenger ticket, come by and drop off passenger ticket. Um, also, the vendor bingo cards, you can drop those off uh, at the registration desk also. We have some raffle prizes, the vendors have some prizes, pretty cool stuff. Less than a week. 
Then it started getting things started getting a little bit more uh, more interesting and uh, uh, somewhat less sophisticated, where all of a sudden the attackers was, of this type of a scenario were start saying, "Well, you know, I work at a computer store. We got the shipment in on Friday." I'm going to break copy protection before this thing technically even goes on sale. Hence the term zero day. That's how long the uh, uh, attack has been publicly available. Exactly zero days. Later on, you would uh, just break into the manufacturer, this manufacturer, this, get their images, and then uh, break it that way. And so that's what's called a zero day. Now, since a lot of hacking and hacker culture, a lot of it sort of came from that era and from that kind of background. Uh, it only makes sense that if you had a vulnerability in a piece of software uh, that no one knew about and you use that to break into the system, that became known as a zero day because knowledge of that exploit had been public for exactly zero days. It used to be that technically, if uh, it became known, let's say through like a, uh, you know, a crack or something like that, someone said, hey, someone's breaking into our sites, and all that, uh, then it's no longer considered zero day because it was publicly known. The whole idea was, as an attacker, that's what you would do. Um, it's reached the point now where uh, even the uh, Non-public exploit techniques are considered. I've heard those referred to as zero day, which is kind of, I think, incorrect. But whatever, I'm willing to uh, adapt, and that's the whole idea. With the, uh, with the, the, the whole idea behind this is that if there's a real neat way to actually pull off some type of exploit, and let's say that someone reported it, they found it, oh, it looks like this might be exploitable. In this, uh, in let's say, uh, you know, Adobe Reader. Um, so they send it to Adobe, and Adobe says, "Yeah, this is this could be as well." The person that actually crafts the thing into a working exploit, they would call that a zero day because it is a day, even though we all know that. So, there you have it. so just keep in mind when I reference zero day during this, I'm going to be talking about the zero day where it's not known publicly. Okay? This is a vulnerability that is not known uh, by anybody. So, we're going to talk about uh, old school compromise. I uh, will we'll delve into my questionable past uh, with this particular slide to kind of discuss some elements of it. Something that uh, we used to do is you would just go in and just take the easiest way in first. You'd only ramp up your attack if you needed to. If you're able to do a site and you know pop it easily with very simple means, that's what you would do. Just get in quick as soon as you can with the least amount of effort. Because um, one thing you should know is that hackers are infinitely lazy. Now, you only use the zero day in a couple of uh, conditions. And one, if you really wanted into that target, there was no other way in. And two, it was worth burning your zero day. Okay, so if you're breaking into some whatever target just for, uh, just for grins, you know, then you may just say, well, I don't want to waste the zero day on that because I don't perceive it to be a value. Side. Whereas if you were just hell bent on getting in there, then you would probably resort to digging into your bag of uh, evil exploits and uh, pulling out a zero day and going with that. And that was that was what we did back in the day. Um, also back in the day, you had to be kind of skilled at being a system administrator, and there was a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one thing is uh, you typically would patch the system. So if I pop a system, I don't want, and I got it through some, particularly if it's an easy piece, I wanted to make sure I was the only one in there. 
and no one else got in. So a lot of times I would just go ahead and patch the system. Uh, that way it prevents someone from coming behind me and making a lot of noise and ruining my good time. And that's a bad one. Uh, and then uh, another thing was to monitor systems to keep you find sysadmins here to keep you from poking around wondering what the hell the problem is. I mean, even if there's something legitimately wrong with the system, uh, I remember a, a particular print server that sat in an ISP in New Zealand that I was really partial to because it served as a great storage locker. And so uh, I would monitor that thing, and not only would I keep it patched up, like if there were patched or if there were print jobs that got caught, I would try to take care of <laughs> <laughs> the system because I didn't want some admin in there also poking around saying, hey, wait a minute. And I don't recall that in the boss. You know, so you kind of would do that to kind of uh, you know, maintain things. And uh, just, you know, that print server stayed until we were uh, under my control until the uh, ISP went under, which was a sad thing. <laughs> I know, I was like, yeah, I, know. I feel your sadness too. So. Um, the other thing is once you're detected, so you're out there on the giant global map of the internet, and you hit this particularly interesting island and you're there, you discover on that island, Okay, you get kicked off of there because someone's detected you. You keep marked headliners on that island and then never travel to that island again. You just move through that was something you had hit. Oh, add and maybe onto this. And there usually was plenty of fish in the sea, or plenty of islands in the sea, I guess, that thought it was only probably. And the other one was you stayed the hell out of the dot mil, dot gov, any of the Contractors, I'm sure that uh, any of the infrared people from here were happy to hear that. But uh, that's what we did. It's just like you avoided those things because they there tended to be a lot, a lot more severe consequences for it. So that's old school. So now let's talk about new school. And this is the kind of stuff that we're starting to see today. Okay, I've got the same list there. And basically, these items are kind of the same. An attacker will use the easiest way in. Now, when I say attacker, I'm kind of talking to right now about uh, 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 your uh, the evil APT people. Okay, and this kind of is a bit of a background. In spite of my uh, useful indiscretions, my previous employer, the Bureau, was working for the uh, a uh, government contractor, uh, and my contracts, the particular projects I worked on were typically paid for by FDHS, FBI, and NSA. So I dealt with, when I was there, a lot of APT type stuff. And <coughs> that, this is what we would see is that they would basically, uh, they would. Uh, Use the easiest thing possible, you know, send in that thing that says it's called malware.exe and then ask your users to please run this and please click on every warning possible to make it run. Thank you. And you know, if that didn't work, they could continually escalate. And if they really want it in, they run zero thing. And after a while, they ended up learning what the environment was after you know, being in there several times. And so they would, uh, they sometimes would know what's all we do take is your data to a different place. And that's all they would do, just to save themselves time. Because again, the package are lazy. Um, as far as being skilled in sysadmin techniques, not really. Okay, there is a little bit of that they're kind of aware, but they'll do just the bare minimal. For the most part, it's get in, stay in, if the systems go down or crash, or if something's going to require admin's attention, they get in there. They're just in there to go ahead and do their thing. And, <coughs> oh, sorry again. 
And as far as the rest of it goes, they don't care if they get kicked out. They don't care if they're discovered, and they don't care if it's not done or not done. In fact, those are some of the juicier targets for them. So they're going to go ahead and hit them and continue hitting them. And like I, like I mentioned, they have a tendency to kind of uh, uh, learn the environment that they're attacking. So when they come back in, they can save time. It's creepy when you're looking at a piece of malware that's been uh, uh, pulled off of the system and you see the uh, internal uh, internal IP addresses of your uh, of your uh, uh, web proxy hard coded into an executable. That's kind of a, a, an alarming thing to say, oh, they've been here before. They kind of got the lay out of my head. That's kind of creepy stuff. So this is how things are now, another thing that's kind of happened uh, uh, here, kind of in the past, uh, it's really, this is really kind of coming uh, forward uh, recently, it's been the monetization of exploits. And this has had an impact on the overall uh, security uh, landscape as well. Um, when I say monetization of exploits, I'm talking about there's exploits that uh, people want and they're willing to pay for them. Uh, so I'm not a fan of those. I'm not a fan of bounties, uh, for example. Uh, and I'm definitely not a fan of the places that have these uh, uh, bug brokers uh, because it's caused some problems. I predicted in 2001 in the conference, in fact, I predicted that this would suck. Uh, the, uh, I was on a panel. Uh, one of the other people on the panel, was one person provided that, so it was on the, this doesn't suck uh, side. But the guy that was arguing with me was a guy from US CERT and said, This is going to lead to bad things. So it's not like it was a, uh, uh, a weird thing that. Uh, me to think that, that it was going to be evil, but uh, others did as well. Um, I don't think there's anything that actually could have prevented this from occurring. It just looked like it was going to eventually. And part of the reason was because there were employers uh, that were getting paid to find bugs. Uh, that was how I got, I came out of the IT sysadmin world and into uh, the uh, security vendor space in the uh, you know, late 90s, specifically to do this. It was go find bugs and make attention for our using bugs in our product and then kind of work with the company and you had a scanner that would scan systems for bugs and things like that while they were done. So, um, it was just a small step for someone to say, hey, I'm no longer going to work for an employer. I'm going to go freelance and I'll just sell these things to, to uh, whoever will buy them. And it's at the point now where there's actually people that are making a living from this uh, exclusively. I mean, particularly when you think, well, you know, they can do, uh, uh, they can get like you know, six figures at this point for uh, Particularly with juicy bugs. And so you only have to find a couple per year, and then they, they, you can know, live anywhere at that point. You're just kind of you know, free and you don't have to do a lot, go to places that have all the ways to play. Now, the, uh, the impacts of this is that the uh, if something's unpatched, all of a sudden it becomes more valuable. So for the people that are that know how to find these bugs, who normally were doing uh, you know some type of disclosure, even if they were dropping full exploit code out on that bug track back in the day, or they were behaving responsibly and uh, sending stuff to the vendor and getting a patch. Unpatched meant that it's more valuable, so there's less incentive to get things patched. 
Now, this doesn't apply across the board, it's not a blanket statement, but in general, this does occur. And uh, for a long time, we just to try to kind of combat it, uh, believe it or not, of all people, uh, uh, the U.S. government uh, used to pay the loss. They don't even know. Uh, mainly because they just kind of got out of it because it's too bad. Uh, weaponized is even more valuable. Now, weaponized means that this isn't just knowledge of uh, the core, some type of proof of concept that if you run this, it's going to uh, you know, do its little turning along and maybe work half the time. We're talking it will work and it will get in there and do its thing. You will be compromised if uh, you get hit with this weaponized. Then, and the target likely will not know. If the weaponization uh, can bypass anything built in, such as uh, there's various technologies built into it, the US or uh, the crap that gets loaded on, you know, those, all those things that you load onto the computer for security purposes. I think there's roughly you know, for every user app, there has to be some type of security agent or app or something in there. So, if it can bypass all of those, even better. It's worth even uh, more money. Now, the problem with this is, is that it lowers the bar for entry into this uh, attack arena. And so, that means that Somebody that just purchased their way into the space. They decide they want to attack, they've got money, they can do so. And this gives rise to certain things. You see, I don't know what everyone's feelings are on, say, let's, you know, let's say the hacking team, for example, remember hacking team that up in uh, Italy. A few people nodding about that. Right? Yeah. Well, look, look it up, they got popped pretty bad. For retaliation, and they did some kind of you know, questionable things. And they were able to get into the space specifically uh, by paying for a lot of the exploits. Uh, they did have their own program for developing, but they also purchased a lot as well. Well, we talked about uh, offense a little bit. Let's talk about defense a little bit. And what's been going on with that, and how it's changed. So we'll start with the uh, firewalls. The original concept, for those of you who know what OSI layers are, the original concept is kind of started with the TCP realm. And it moved up. Not only did it move up through the seven layers that make up the uh, OSI model, uh, up to application layer, it actually made it to data layer, okay, which really isn't there. You can think about our human. That's, that's, that's how high up uh, this would go. And that is that the firewalls were expected to be able to say, well, uh, I'm going to block this data uh, from occurring in this particular context. It was looking at the context in which the data actually exists. That's the direction that firewalls are trying to head and trying to move. Now, this is going to miss you a lot. Sorry. But, uh, uh, firewalls are dead, okay? They're dead. They were killed by the cloud. That's what, uh, that's what happened with them. Uh, because all the emphasis now is on the data and getting to the data no matter where it resides, uh, from wherever. And so firewalls kind of become irrelevant in that type of discussion. Now, you still need to maintain a perimeter on your network, but for the most part, you can do this with routers. Routers have the basic stuff built in them that kind of allow you to uh, you know, limit and create the borders around your network. Uh, so there's that. Um, the other thing is that the desktop firewalls actually have become way more important, particularly in the context of your determined attacker who's managed to get into your <coughs> Uh, or at least within the zone of 
where your data resides, be it uh, uh, in the cloud or, or, or wherever. And desktop firewalls, this is something that I personally, this is what I've been doing, uh, even on my home network for uh, a long time. And there are, have been some companies that are actually looking and doing this as well. Uh, and it all depends on where the data is. The more you push the data out uh, away from the users and into the cloud, the more you can kind of get away with this. This is something that's been talked about and debated among uh, uh, security professionals and stuff. I know this is like a hot. This was a hot topic at uh, at the hacker cons and stuff. When we go to that bar and sort of like argue, we argue about whether you still needed a firewall at all, whether you need a firewall for the you know the perimeter you know, and move it to the workstation, move it to the laptop, whatever in there. Uh, you guys remember when scanning was a big thing? Remember that? It's not a big thing anymore. Uh, it, it really doesn't matter. I mean, because you, everyone knows, uh, you know, 425 is going to be open. And it really, it, who cares that 425 is open? All you know is that if I send an email, that the victims inside this company are going to click on it. That's all you really need to know. You don't need to figure out what ports they get up or are on their website. You know which you know the top ports, everyone knows them. You really don't need it. And uh, I remember 15, 20 years ago, it was a big deal if you can you just break people over the polls and you could do some type of scanning and programming and figure out what the system was running on the other end of that scan. Uh, hey, is this running on uh, previous CPU? Hey, is this running Windows? That was a big deal, and so an entire talks were given at security conferences about it, and how horrid that was and the dangers of that. Now, pretty much the target's uh, operating system, they pretty much give it up uh, to anyone that's uh, sitting in the vicinity. Uh, if you Go to uh, Best Buy and purchase an uh, HP laptop running Windows. If you can, from looking at the uh, super trace when this thing is first brought up online, you determine you'll, you'll notice Windows it starts immediately going home to Microsoft servers and everything. Because it's got the HP crapware on it, it's going to phone home to HP. And depending upon various uh, settings and what, what actual OS is on there, you'll be able to determine, determine a major version, whether it's Windows 8 or Windows 10. And because Microsoft still does all the patching in plain text, it's not encrypted, uh, you'll be able to determine patch level on the system. The first thing it does is it checks to see what uh, patches are. And you can take a look at that and you know what patch level it is on it. It does sign the patches when it downloads them. So there's at least that. Uh, so I mean, before they didn't even do that, maybe you could just shuffle it around and ask people and say, here's your update, and then you just take it and install it, which is that specific patch. But you know, now I mean, you know, it's they at least can take care of that. But by the way, they do this for caching purposes. Okay, kind of hard to cache stuff uh, somewhere if it's encrypted. So when you can plain text, it gets a little easier to uh, get to that. All right, antivirus. Uh, this is also going to be a depressing slide, sorry. Uh, it's pretty much on every desktop and server. And guess what? It is dead or it's dying. Yeah, most security professionals at this point, at least in the space that I occupy as a researcher, uh, we pretty much think uh, antivirus is dead. Uh, many of us don't run it at home anymore. You know, on our home systems, and we have to run it at work. If we're supporting you know, my employer, we were kind of back shop, so we don't run There's no need for it in our environment. Not the way we do things. 
Um, and you say, well, you know, what happens if these attackers are going to send up this uh, you know, small 50 to 60 guys? Well, uh, the guys who really know what they're doing, they've got their own homegrown virus total like setups where they buy a legitimate copy of every single uh, antivirus uh, software thing that's out there. They try to mirror, at least mirror what's on that virus mode. Uh, and then they will test the malware before they have. Uh, deployed it on a good site. That way they know what it's, you know, and they'll do custom compiles and stuff, so they'll make sure that they know that this is what's going to uh, occur, and that way they can get around uh, that whole thing. And the thing that's really funny is that they use uh, virus total to uh, check for counter detection. So they have a custom piece of malware. Let's say they're going to attack, they're going to attack by like, say, five sites. Each site will have a custom compile. Change it ever so slightly so that they'll have five uh, different identity five signatures of that executable that gets uh, sent to these five other locations. Now once those five locations, if, if someone finds it, they may send it to virus total. So the bad guys are taking those and the fives in their query virus total to see if they've encountered detected. So that's kind of a Technique is kind of uh, come out of that. I mentioned that. So, you know, antivirus is that's that's a that's a top one. If you ask me which one to use, I'd say if you're on Windows box, I'd say use Windows Defender because it comes with a just uh, a good amount. Um, which may worry about any of you, but. Sorry. Um, I guess, I guess, I don't know if anyone still uses intrusion detection and intrusion prevention uh, systems at all, but pro probably some do. Uh, these things are uh, usually tons of false positives, or on the flip side, is that if you decide, I don't want any false positives, I'm not going to run all those false signatures, I'm only going to use custom signatures. You still will reach a ceiling limit at some point where it cannot process all the signatures you want on there uh, before you start dropping packets. Uh, so that's kind of a, uh, a rough thing uh, to, to deal with these things. They're not as dead or dying as the other stuff is, but there still is some issues with these guys, but uh, uh, they're not as uh, popular. Uh, did anyone ever hear? I don't have to raise your hand if you, you don't want to, but uh, use IPS in production the way it was intended to where it sees live traffic going to a production system and it kills it because it says there's something bad in that screen. I don't know if personally you have to see people shaking their heads no. I I don't know of anyone that deployed this in that fashion without having to unemploy it. If you did, great, okay. You know, hats off to you for you know, trying. I, I really appreciate it. But uh, it's not as bad as a lot of the other technologies, but it really is still kind of a bad guy. Um, uh, more fun. Uh, anomalous behavior detection. You see this. Uh, it's been in antivirus type stuff. It's actually beginning to move actually into the OS at this point. Uh, a good example of this is uh, uh, Emmet. If you're a Windows shop, you may be familiar with Emmet. If you're not, E M E T, though, I cannot remember off the top of my head what it stands for. It stands for, we're going to look at that, which is not going to have Just Google E M E T. Windows got Emmet. And that will uh, give you uh, a, uh, an idea of this kind of uh, detection of weird things going on inside the inside the OS. Uh, by the way, if you if you have one of those machines, you need to have it on for all of them. Okay, so to do that for sure. Now it is it is extremely useful. It's not enough, but it's extremely useful that you do this whole thing. Anomalous behavior detection. Okay, because basically you're talking about your AP type stuff that's got signatures. Okay, 
this is the direction everything's kind of moving. Everyone brags how they're not using signatures, even though if you're like the cool parts that are in reverse engineering these things at all, they still aren't using signatures, okay? Uh, but, but nonetheless, I mean, there's a lot of this behavioral stuff that they're uh, looking, looking at. Uh, this stuff needs to evolve into uh, uh, I think we're heading in the right direction with that. Uh, you know, we're just, just going to kind of keep moving in because this is the one area. Of all these other areas, this is kind of the one area where uh, the bar gets raised from these hackers at least as much as the attackers are raising the bar on the defenses. Okay. So at least there's like a, some area here where the, uh, where, where the defenses are actually going to stand for a good chance. Now, what all these things have in common, uh, these are technologies that look at a single slice. And this is the big reason why they died, why they failed, is because it's just looking at a single particular slice. And alone, typically these require dedicated personnel. You have the firewall guy, or you have the, the desktop group that gets charged with making sure that the AV is on all the desktops. And, uh, you know, just, just different. You know, or you have you know the uh, the snort guy, okay? He sits there scratching his head, you know, wondering why his life is coming to this. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just snort my last shot. Okay, and he's it was uh, painful at times. He started running into uh, limits that the system was imposing on him. To try to do something, but uh, they only look at these thin slices and. And with their dedicated people, and as a result, they become uh, very expensive because alone they're useless. I mean, they give you this really thin slice in time that doesn't tell you a lot about a modern day attack. You just, if you have some packets came across, you know, there was an alert that occurred on a system that ran. Malware triggered on it. That doesn't tell you the full story of the attack. Not in today's modern world where people are you know, doing all kinds of clever things like imposing more than one backdoor on the system and killing the one that's been captured, that didn't activate the one that's found, or leaving two systems infected with the old one and then the other 35 that they infected, they go to the new one. So we find that. You know, when you open up two boxes, you got to do that kind of stuff. They do that. They, they, they know how the shops work and how they investigate. But I call that the lost keys syndrome. You know, when you lose your keys and you find them in the living room, you don't go, you know what, I think I'll go check the kitchen one more time. You don't, you don't, you don't do that. You, because you've got the keys, and that's exactly what they're hoping to do by those two boxes. But uh, you know, have the keys out. Okay, well, anyway, back to what these things have in common. Uh, if you fend them all into a central console, that does help. But, and this quote is not for me, this is from a co worker who's having to evaluate this stuff in my last job. He said, the console puts all my false positives in one place. <laughs> so, just like, so now I, now I go right here to have a list of things I can do. <laughs> uh, so, it's good if you know how to search and you know how to accurately correlate uh, this data to, get, to actually piece something together from it. And this is harder than you think. I mean, because you can have an attack because of the way these technologies work and because of the way the attackers are now approaching things, they will put together nice little puzzles for you. For example, some of the Chinese uh, groups that we had looked at 
when they were attacking, they might do something like, uh, uh, like say, one particular group that may only use Yahoo accounts to send in the initial fish. So I'm going to do everything with it, essentially, it's a Yahoo account. Okay. Then you could do a couple of things. Why don't you just block all of Yahoo.com if you wanted to? Yahoo.uk, Yahoo.com, and just you could block all the Yahoo's, okay, uh, if you wanted. And continue on that path. But then you might be eliminating uh, actual legitimate mail. What if it's Gmail? Because there's some of those groups that use Gmail. Again, Kill every bit of Gmail that comes in, a lot of your business that comes in that way. So you can't necessarily do that. However, if it's like, what if it has an attachment? What if the attachment has a certain subject line? What if the attachment uh, has a domain reference in the email and that domain appeared uh, on the internet last Thursday? And today is Tuesday. When you start pulling those random elements together, at least some of this technology may pick up, then uh, now we start getting into kind of the future kind of stuff where things uh, are kind of headed. So, we have to use what we have because we don't have any other choice. Uh, we need to gather the right data from these older technologies so that they don't appear to us as dead or, or dying or be failures. You kind of pull this so to kind of pull them together, get the right data out of these, and that has to be combined with any new technologies to go forward. Uh, we gotta hope that the consoles themselves get smarter. They need to be extremely smart. And now we're talking about getting into the realm of you know artificial intelligence or uh, machine learning is the uh, uh, thing that you hear a lot now. What do we think? Uh, code is actually learning something about what's, uh, what's going on with people. Of course, that begs the question can uh, machine learning, can artificial intelligence actually uh, save us? If this stuff is written now, uh, it's not well known. I don't think it is it's written yet. It certainly is not being deployed on a wide scale of someone's writing. Uh, it may be out there in someone's GitHub or something where they're actually doing a real, real, real cool work with this kind of thing. Uh, the problem is, is that uh, most machine learning algorithms, and there's a whole, whole bunch of different uh, uh, types uh, of uh, Basic algorithms that a lot of this stuff is based off of. Uh, finding five bad items in, say, a cup of pudding is hard. Okay, and the reason is because uh, machine learning typically, if you're putting it in place, it requires uh, using a baseline of known good. So you're going to take a whole bunch of one and assume that. The traffic that you're going to feed into it is nothing but good traffic, and there's no bad in it at all. So that's a trick. Okay, but let's assume that you're able to get a hold of good data. You got to shovel a whole ton of it through there to actually make it learn this is what good stuff looks at. And again, previous job would be experiment with this kind of thing, where we're pulling in what we think is a uh, Good data. Let's so even just constructing it uh, in a weird way where you're faking a lot of the data. Okay, just to test the algorithms. You send in the five bad things, and the uh, uh, the uh, uh, machine learning stuff says, okay, when you gave me two million events, I found the five bad things, but the five that I found, I found them inside this group of 10,000. Okay, and you think, okay, that's great. I reduced it from 2 million down to 10,000. But you really don't want to send 10,000 alerts to your uh, guy around the console and say, hey, five of these are probably going to be bad. <laughs> you don't want to do that kind of thing. All right, so you just got to be exact. And you want to do it to the point where you're not letting actually 
people have in the community. So it's a it's a hard problem. And even if you get this up moved into production, you're still going to have tons of false positives, which is going to infuriate whoever's running it, or I should say running, whoever's responsible for dealing with the crap that the generates. And the thing is, is the other thing, you know, having looked at this from the other end as well, you have to present your proof to this person that has the data that you actually have a hit. This is something that uh, uh, I think that a lot of you that are having to deal with IT people or are IT people are used to you get this alert and you're just like, is this real? The first thing you do is you go, is this a real alert or is this a false positive? Because we've been conditioned by our tools to realize that there's problems with them, that they're, uh, they're, they're not infallible. They're, very foul, and this is a foul time. I mean, it's just you really, really uh, need to have that proof, and that you got a hit. And this is considered just as hard as finding those five to begin with. So essentially, the solutions are going to have to be very simple, and they're going to have to be easy to deploy and use. No, and they're going to have to have no agents. Because that's the last thing you really want to do is post yet another chunk of code on the US about people and then to the board. It's just going to piss them off. It is. And it has to be seamless. So it's just got to work. It's got to work with everything. You can't say, well, I'm sorry that doesn't work quite as well. We've got all those very servers there. No, it's got to work with that too. Not just the Windows boxes, not just the Macs. Chrome. I got Chrome tabs. Yeah, what are you going to do? Does it work with this stuff as well? Everything is got to all work. Well, some uh, gotchas that we're going to run into. Now, I, I do believe this is the right, like, roughly the right path. Uh, uh, we, need, we need better tools. But uh, uh, gotchas we're going to run into uh, the Internet of Things. Y'all heard about the Internet of Things, right? And put that, you know, your toaster is going to be pingable. And you start thinking, well, did you know I'm uh, in my office? But I'll tell you something that you allow in your office now that was back in the day, you didn't do that. Let them talk to Edward, and that's these guys. Now, there's a time when you think we didn't do a, a, attach your phone to the network. What the hell is this thing doing with an IP address anyway? Okay, this is a phone. This is an internet of thing right here. This is exactly what it is. Someone said, hey, I don't have an IP address on my phone. On the telephone. You know? And 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 wham, well, there it goes. Well, there's gonna be other things, other technologies that are gonna occur that people are gonna pull into the office. Who here remembers a time before wireless? Yeah, yeah. Everyone is uh, all the news are like, what? <laughs> it's always been that way. No, no. The time you had to have a cable to plug everything in. And it was, it was that, it was that stupid VP, this is where I kind of work, it was that stupid VP who wanted to be able to take his laptop, and he insisted on a laptop, not a desktop system. Because he was a jerk. And, <laughs> and he said, I want to be able to be on the network and pick up my laptop and walk down the hall to a meeting. And I'm still on the network. And I'll walk back. Because I can use this wireless stuff at home and I can do that at home. You know, and he was a VP. So he just said, Look, I'm putting in this wireless thing in my office. I don't care. You do that pretty soon. Here we are. We're having to you know, deal with the uh, Wi Fi now. This is kind of, expect more of this crap, okay? You're going to get more of this. Uh, so that's going to be a problem. The other one is the whole bring your own device uh, movement. Uh, if you start moving the data to the cloud, there's going to be people that are going to say, well, you know, it's just credentials, right? 
I can access this from my home system, no big deal. You know, because I've left my laptop at work or whatever. And I don't know about you, but most, uh, a lot of companies now, they issue their employee laptops anyway. And in some cases, they don't necessarily care what's running on them. Just as long as you get the data, you get your And I know some people that, like myself, for example, that I do a lot of work from home systems. So, and of course, that whole you know, smartphone thing. When you've got that, that's a real company. And so, I mean, you have people doing this all the time. So, I got a few final thoughts for trying to run uh, wrap it up here. Uh, I want to give some uh, general advice. Keep in mind, uh, strong passwords, two-factor authentication. Uh, if you don't know what two-factor authentication is, or whatever they want for uh, or do well. But uh, uh, two-factor is something you have and something you know. Something you know would be your password, something you have would be something like, uh, well, you get one of those 20-year-old technology RSA token things that are like, that are believably painful to uh, uh, install, implement, support, or you can do it like, you know, on your phone when you get pushed on your phone, that's kind of cool. Uh, you need to limit where these authentication events come from as well. It's, it doesn't make any sense. If you do not have a user base in China, then don't allow authentications to come into your authenticated phone <laughs> from China. Okay? I mean, all your employees that are going to be accessing the data are US based, restricted to US. Um, there's stuff that out there that allows you to do that kind of stuff. Uh, this next one I don't know how to react to. Um, patch immediately on patch availability. Okay? Don't test patches. Okay? And this is probably some of you are thinking, are you kidding me? I'm not going to test that junk that I get sent by the vendor before I push it out on all these systems. Well, Already, even after testing, a lot of times, and I know there's going to be people who are going to say, yeah, uh, a lot of times after you've tested it, you push it out, whammo, you've broken an entire department. And what, what you have to do, you have to get good at figuring out how to recover from patches. So just do that. Just get good at recovering when it goes bad. Okay? Well, that's all you have to do. Because you're going to do it anyway. So, patch now. And believe it or not, this is something like a, like on Wall Street, something they started doing like 10, 15 years ago. And it doesn't matter, let's just patch now. We need it because people try to get to our stuff. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that uh, I know there's pen testers here and there's people that hire pen testers. Uh, penetration testing is not compromised. <coughs> Okay. Penetration testing is looking for every single hole in the system and then writing up this report saying, hey, look, you've got like a zillion ways into this piece of switch cheese you call a network. You can even fix it. Here's a list. And that's what the uh, pet testers do. I've done it before. It is a horrid job. Okay. It's, it sounds sexy. You break it into systems, and it is when you pop know, the first one. But then when you got to pop about, you know, 300 of them, and you're on a deadline, and you're trying to make a budget, and you have a student report, you must all these student systems and tell them about all these student goals. It becomes a real awful job. Yeah. Yeah. But the thing is, is that penetration testing, uh, a, lot of people, a lot of pen testers don't give the, the attack perspective. Uh, they, 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 they get it wrong. I mean, it is a completely different mindset. Okay. This, a penetration tester, a lot of times, uh, you find people will impose rules upon them. Uh, no rebooting of production systems. Uh, no, uh, no attacking Department X, because Department X does the stuff that's extraordinarily critical. So don't, don't uh, get that. Uh, whereas the attacker, you care less about rebooting the systems. I know. 
I've done it. Remember that print server in New Zealand? You gotta come and patch that thing and apply the patch and you're going to I waited until they were, you know, soft hours. Yeah, I tried to be a reasonable human being. I didn't want to be tempted, right? So, and just hope that no one noticed that the box rebooted in the middle of the night and it's running just fine. So, but, uh, you know, keep that, uh, keep that in mind. Uh, we'll get toward the end and uh, kind of ran out of time. Uh, anyway, these are two ways to, to track me down. You can uh, reach me via email if you've got questions. Uh, and you can uh, follow me on the, on the tweets uh, there with my uh, handle. Uh, we probably could ask maybe, maybe one or two really quick questions if you have something. Uh, uh, perhaps at the same time, if you can put your question more of an answer, that might be good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe just one interesting question, or an interesting question. Any, 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 Good. I was hoping no one was saying, did you bring it to my company? Like, <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> I want it everywhere. Anyway, that's pretty much all I have. I'll be around, so just feel free to run and ask me whatever, uh, away from the microphone and all that, as you see fit.